you found a place to belong here in the Circle of Friends. I'm Missy, and I'm with Gwen today. Gwen, welcome back. Good morning, Missy. Well, How what's on your mind today? Yes, mm. I'm doing good. I don't know. I flipped open the Word, and I ended up in the book of First John, which is one of my favorites. So, do you want to go, like... I don't know, pillage and just kind of see what all we can dig up in there today. Let's visit First John today. Yeah. I'm feeling a little bit like a treasure hunt. (laughs) How's that? I love it. I love it. Let's do it. I don't know. Um, So, okay. So background, because I always like to do this. The book of First John was written by the disciple that Jesus loves, John. Um, And he was one of the intimate three and probably the best friend of Jesus. Um, I always like to point out, too, that John calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. Not in an arrogant way, because it's, no. it's an odd way to put it. The disciple that Jesus loved. Yeah. Oh, well, God, Jesus loved me. Mm-hmm. and he did. No, he's just, it's, it's an, he's in awe. Yeah. He's, it, it just blows his mind every time he says this, that Jesus loved him. He can't quite grasp mm-hmm. that. And you know that by reading his letters, yeah. his epistles. First John, well, and, and the gospel account as well. But you see that. That, especially, I think, through First John. Yeah, I think you're right. And so these are letters that he would have written to the early churches um, to just kind of encourage them. And um, he very much writes like he is a father writing to his children. There's lots of love being conveyed in these chapters. Um, but the book of First John is actually talking about um, from start to finish about how that we might know that we have eternal life. Mm, yes. And so what was kind of going on is that it was really in some ways hard to tell if all of these people who were claiming to be a part of the church at those times were really walking. Okay. And there would have been some people who were trying to figure out, you know, well, I think I've given Christ my life, but you know, how do, how do I know for sure? Um, and so there was maybe some struggle with eternal security going on within the body. Um, some things like that, but this is one of the places that I will send people for doubt about your salvation. Um, there are, Many of us who have accepted Christ young and do not have a dramatic conversion life story like Paul, where we did all these horrible things before and then the lights came on and we give God our lives and our lives look completely different. Um, When we've grown up in the church and in the faith, we grow up good kids sometimes and we make um, choices to follow Christ, but there really isn't this startling before and after. Um, and so we grow up in the faith thinking, okay, well, I'm, I'm assuming this is mine, but sometimes we struggle with the eternal security piece. Like, am I really saved? Like, what does that mean? Um, and so this is a great place to go because this whole book is is written, um, according to chapter five, written that you may know that you have eternal life. Mm. Um, and I'm going to pick it up in 13. These things I've written to you who believe in the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we've asked of him. Um, I, th- this is just full of little signs, little things that you can look at that just prove your salvation out. Okay, so let's start, and we'll just poke up, poke and pick up a couple of these here and there. Um, I think I'm going to take us to, um, let's go to chapter 3 and verse 14. Okay. Um, and I'll just, I'm not going to do any specific order on these. I'm just going to pick them up here and there. So this is the sign that we love, the love of the brethren. So in other words, those that are the part of the body of Christ. If you are a believer, there should be obvious signs that you love fellow believers mm. um, and that you, um, in relationship with them, there is care and um, just a love for them, a heart for them. So verse 14 reads, um, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. 
Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Mm -hmm. We know this, that he laid down his life for us, talking about Jesus, and we ought to lay down our very lives for our brethren. But whosoever has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? Yeah. That's pretty strong. Yeah, it's strong pretty word. obvious and it's pretty strong and it's stated strongly on purpose. But it it's loving those around us is as obvious as life and death. Mm-hmm. You either do or you don't. Yeah. You know, and There's so no middle ground there. Right. And he's he's a little bit um blunt in some of these areas. Okay, let's throw another one. Um, Verses 3 through 6 of the same chapter. Um, This is a sign of salvation that we no longer practice sin. And it says, everyone who has this hope fixed on him purifies himself just as he is pure. Talking about God. Um, Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Just in case you didn't know that. (laughs) There you go. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins. And in him, there is no sin. No one who abides in him, capital H, sins. No one who sins has seen him or knows him. Now... We're, we're still dealing with a sinful nature, so obviously we have to take that into account here because we take the whole of Scripture right. as the ultimate context for one passage. Well, and um, several several translations say continues to sin or keeps on sinning right. or it's the practice of. And if we keep reading, he actually clarifies that himself. Um, so let's keep going. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous, just as God is righteous, just as he is. The one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. No one who is born of God practices sin, because his seed abides in him and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. So he is he's literally just clarifying where's the line. Okay, let's talk about this. If you're walking in sin and you're not feeling convicted and you're not feeling um like you know better and you need to be you need to be getting your life on track with God then you would be what we consider walking in sin and practicing it. And if you're doing that and you're not miserable, then you need to rethink whether or not salvation is yours. Mm. Um, Because the Holy Spirit's job is to lead us to repentance. Um, It's to be nudging our spirit if we are walking in sin. We should be pretty miserable. He's guiding us, yeah. And and God, as a good father, uh, is going to chastise us and chasten us so that we get on the right path. Mm-hmm. We, we walk in the right way. Um, there's another sign in, in chapter 4, and I think I'm going to pick this one up in verse 6. Um Okay, you know what? Let's let's back up a little bit more. Verse 4. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Meaning um, the spirit of the Antichrist and, and other things. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and he who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. I don't know about you, but I have seen this more and more the older I get. That it's like there are certain people that I can be talking to, and they cannot grasp what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's like they can't even hear it. Um. It's like their logic is just so different that they can't even understand the principles from which I'm deriving my conversation. Yeah, they're they're blind, truly blinded to the truth. Yeah. 
Um, and there's a couple of key areas I see that in more than others. But it's so interesting to me because right here we have John drawing a distinction that if you're not of the kingdom, and I think of another word ver- verse that says that if you're not of the kingdom, these things are spiritually discerned and they're foolishness yes. to him yes. who, who doesn't understand. Um, and so there's... There's something that happens when the Holy Spirit quickens us that makes us alive and able to understand the things of the Spirit. Um, So that's one of the signs that it's obvious that we are a part of the believer when we can discern the things that are spiritually discerned. Mm. Um, I I remember in college um, just going, God, what does it look like? You know, because my salvation experience was so subtle Mm -hmm. that um, most I didn't have the before and after. And so I remember going, God, I really would love to be able to see and experience somebody have this. And I, I, there was a girl that we sat down and I was trying to explain scriptures and she just couldn't, she couldn't connect with them. She recognized her need for salvation, but she couldn't interpret a passage. Like she read it and it just wasn't clicking. And this was like within a week of me praying that, I think. Um, And she looked at me and she goes, I want to receive Christ. And so we did the prayer right then and there in my little little dorm room. And she went right back to that verse, the same verse we were talking about before, and read it again and went, oh, I get it. (laughs) <laughs> and I just sat there and I went, oh, you know, it's that moment of holy ground where you recognize yeah. that God in front of you, one, he's answering your prayer, but two, that you're seeing salvation. Yeah. I mean, that was just an amazing moment. Um, when we come back, we'll do some more, but let's take a break for a little bit and listen to these couple of things. And we'll see you back at the table in just a minute. You found a place to belong here in the Circle of Friends. In the heart of Amish country, you will find three wonderful, unique stores. The Village Gift Barn, Country Gatherings, and Moxie. Village Gift Barn is filled with beautiful home decor, a boutique with stylish clothing and jewelry. Country Gatherings takes a step back in time with primitive decor and a garden center. Don't forget to visit Moxie, our big city boutique with small town charm. Located in the heart of Amish country, Village Gift Barn, Country Gatherings, gatherings and moxie we're back here in the circle of friends here with missy and gwen and we are looking at first john today you know we were just in chapter four gwen and i want to read some a little passage uh near to the end of that chapter starting with verse 15 whoever confesses that jesus is the son of god god abides in him and he in god so we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear for fear has to do with punishment and whoever fears has not been perfected in love and verse 19 we love because he first loved us Uh, and then it goes on to say if anyone says i love god and hates his brother he is a liar for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love god whom he has not seen and this commandment we have from him whoever loves god must also love his brother yeah Uh, These verses, I can remember um, in college, one of the first times that I really sort of went through the book of of 1 John. Mm. And I was struck by the intimacy of these scriptures of of talking about how how much God loves us and that we love because God loved us. But this love incorporates... I mean, it's it's central to who we are in Christ, right? Because yeah. God is love. And we really can't love without him loving us first. Right. And and in that love that he gives us, he gives us a love for others. Mm-hmm. A love Absolutely. particularly for the brethren. And and abiding in God keeps building that love. And I think when we abide in 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 God, that love is not only for the brethren, but for the people that God himself loves that he created. Yeah. Uh, it's a broader spiritual understanding. 
it yeah. kind of opens your eyes to a kind of a whole new world uh, rather than a narrow view of this, you know, these, this is my world. And, I, you know, it's kind of the selfishness of me, I, and all of that to the broader scope of who God is and how he loves the world, how much he loves the world and how we are to love the world as well because we are in him and because he's given yeah. us that love. It's not even our own love to give. It's his love that he gives us. Yeah. You know, I was talking to my kid, my son, the other day, and um, one of the things he's kind of grown up hearing from me is that I have to love God more than I love you. Yes. Or I, if I love you out of my own strength, I might run out at certain moments. And so if I keep loving God more than I love you, I will always have a constant supply so that no matter what's going on, I have lots of love to give you. Mm, beautiful. And beautiful so this actually came up the other day and he goes, mom, I've got to love God more than you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and I just laughed and I said, you know, it doesn't feel good to hear that that way, does it? And I said, but, but yet I recognize that, yes, you do, because yeah. there's moments when it's not easy to love me, is it? Because I get grouchy. And he goes, yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> uh, but, you know, just teaching that principle of keeping God first. Um yeah, absolutely. Okay, so last sign that I kind of have written down, although there's more in this, but um, it's the sign of a desire to obey God. Mm. And I'm, I'm going to start in chapter 5, verse 1, but it's specifically verse 2. Whoever believes Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commands, and his commands are not burdensome. Um, and so obedience is tied into our love for the Father um, and for the Son. And so if we love God, we obey. And Okay, so, you know, that's a challenge to us as believers. Absolutely. You know, because how many of us, um, you know, we go to church on Sunday, but maybe the rest of the week we live life however we do. Maybe we're sleeping with a boyfriend or a girlfriend or, you know, maybe we're doing things that we know are outside of God's commands. Um, and those commands are not burdensome, this says. They are for our protection and mm. our good. Um, and they are because he loves us. And when we do things God way, God's way, it actually protects us in ways that we just can't even fathom. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and when we do things outside of God's commands, we pay a price. We do. And God doesn't always remove those prices just because we repent. Uh, Some of those consequences are walked out for eternity. Yeah. For a I, lifetime. For a lifetime. I, and I do believe that, you know, the consequences of sin are gone when we get to heaven. Mm -hmm. But consequences on earth you're right they could last for a life generations generations yeah absolutely it's the consequence of the choices that we make so you know we've all whether it's ourselves or other people that kind of find themselves in a mess <laughs> how do we get here what's going on and then you look and you see mm, i didn't i didn't ask god if this was the right thing to do or I really knew that wasn't God's way, but I chose it anyway. And then you find yourself in the midst of those consequences while God continues to love us and will walk with us. And as believers, we should walk with others who mm. it doesn't take away the fact that the consequences are really on us. Like it's in other words, it's a, out of a choice that we have made. And sometimes it's it's a choice out of other people's. Yeah. Choices, that we live out that of we the live out those consequences. That is true as well. Bad choices, yeah. uh, but but this passage is so cool because it's really showing us that obedience to God is it's just the best way to do things. It's the best for mm -hmm. us. It's the easiest, um, and it's how we show our love. It's how we show our love. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we don't we don't obey God for our salvation. That's done. I mean, <laughs> if anything, we love and we obey because of what he's done for us. Exactly. Not to assure that we're good enough. That is nowhere even possible. Um, literally, 
our our obedience is our response back to God yeah. for what He's done yeah. for the salvation and the security that we have in Christ, for the fact that we've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, um, the fact that we are seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that He is our righteousness. Um, and that he has taken our sin. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of Christ in him. Mm. Um, and so it's because of that that we live in obedience and that we should be um, living our faith out day by day, mm. moment by moment. Yeah, I, I think of Samuel and King Saul, you know, where Saul... He, he, he disobeys the Lord, and when Samuel calls it on him, he tries to justify mm. it because he's offering sacrifice. But the, the, the sacrifice that he's offering has been something that God has told him to destroy, right. get rid of. Right. That's, you know. And because he doesn't obey, there are consequences. Mm-hmm. And those consequences are incremental, actually. Yes. And God comes back to him three times. Mm -hmm. And so he's given three times of mercy of being able to be honest and and agree with God on his sin. And he loses loses the throne. He loses the, the, the kingdom because of the consequences of his choices. Yeah. And his own pride in trying to do it himself, which we don't always see that as pride but it is prideful if we think yeah. we're the ones that need to do it well and it's that lack of humility yes he wasn't making himself vulnerable and being honest about what he was doing he was not agreeing with god about his sin at all um and, and the interesting missy i love that you bring this up because a couple chapters later we watch david in the same predicament mm-hmm. and we watch him being confronted with his sin and he is confronted one time and his response is an agreement with God about his sin and sorrow. Yeah. A godly sorrow that leads to repentance. And so he gives, and it's the sin with Bathsheba is what he's confronted over. Um, and so he, he, you literally see a biblical response to sin, like what we should be doing. And it's, it's a beautiful contrast, just a couple chapters after what we see with Saul. And his confrontation. And I I believe that's one of the reasons David is called a man after God's own heart, because he he recognized his sin and confessed it. We we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory Mm -hmm. of God. We all deal with the sin nature. We are we are going to stumble and fall, be tempted, all those things in this book of first john is awesome because it it tells us the exact thing that we need to do and that is to confess our sins agree with god and then repent of the sin and god is faithful and just to forgive us our sins but when we don't confess we leave the walls of up you know that block the relationship Mm -hmm. with god um our salvation is not taken away but our relationship is broken um when we are in disobedience to him and there is a way there is a way to mm-hmm. uh, to correct that, to prevent that. But it, again, it's choices that we make. And understanding that, I think, is key to an ongoing close relationship with him. Yeah. And, and you know, there's another one in here um, that I will mention, I guess, because I just stumbled on this one, too. This one I don't have marked as much. But chapter 5, verse 4, talks about our victory mm. over this world. And, you know, that's not always... When it talks about this, it's not that... Um, we're going to look successful as the world defines it. Um, but walking in the victory, just listen to these verses for this, for whatever, um, is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith, who is the one who overcomes the world, but he who believes that Jesus is the son of God. So our faith is our victory, being able to live and walk by faith. Um, and, when our faith stays constant and strong in the face of our circumstances being rocky, 
then we know that we are walking in our faith. Mm. We know that we are in the sweet spot, that spot where um, we are walking connected enough to him that the circumstances don't shake us. Mm. And, and, you know, I, I don't know about listeners today, but I think we are all just kind of walking through uncertainty and, you know, we're all kind of having to suspend our, some of our planning on things because we don't know if things are going to close again or what's going to happen or just whether we're going to be schooling all of our kids from home again sometime or, or just what life is going to look like. I mean, this is just kind of a season where there's not as much predictability as we've had in the past. Um, Um, I've had to get more creative with my job so that I can meet potential needs that I may have, you know, with the kids and, you know, just things like that, that it's just a different season. And there's some people that are walking in fear, Mm. but as a believer, the answer is to walk by faith, to walk in faith and to let your faith be stronger and louder than your fear. Um, That's what this is talking about. That's what it looks like to walk your faith out where the rubber meets the road. Your faith is louder than your fear. Mm. And you can develop that by carving out time for the Lord and spending time in his presence. Um, So my encouragement is get in the word. The surest way to beefing up the strength of your faith so that it can sustain you in times like this is to be in God's word and to build up um, the storehouses of your faith inside. So listeners, um, it is our prayer that God walks with you. Um, that's the truth. He walks with you. Um, I pray that you're seeking his face and that, um, you are striving, um, to be anchored in him. You found a place to belong here in the circle of friends. This program was brought to you through the generous support of donors and listeners like you. To contact Circle of Friends Ministries, you can write to P.O. Box 345, Berlin, Ohio, 44610, or find us on Facebook at circleoffriends.fm. Program archives can be found at thelight959.com.